Today, we are really honored to have Professor Charles Costa with us. Um, he is a senior fellow at the Stanford Institute for Economics Policy Research, at the Precor Institute for Energy, and at the Woods Institute for the Environment, um, and professor by courtesy of economics. Um, today, he is going to talk to us about um, climate and energy and economic perspective. Um, so, Professor Charles Costa, please uh, take, a, take it away by sharing your screen. Terrific. It's terrific to be here with you all. And um, we're on a tight schedule, and particularly tight because I'm not sure what the schedule is. So, uh, we'll, we'll make some progress here, and uh, hopefully, um, the whole point is really to stir imagination and ideas. Uh, rather than to convey much, uh, much, much of uh, facts and substance. So let's let's go through uh, superficially some dimensions of climate economics. So I'm sort of assuming everybody uh, knows uh, at least the rudimentary uh, science, natural science of climate change. We're not going to deal with that. Uh, basically, it's going to boil down to carbon dioxide, even though it's, it's really just one of several uh, greenhouse gases, but uh, as a shorthand, I'll, I'll often refer to either greenhouse gases or CO2. So there are two big questions in uh, the economics of climate change. And I should say, if you have any comments or questions, use the chat button. I uh, will pause in about 10, 10 15 minutes to uh, see if there are anything, clarifications that are needed. Uh, Jenny is going to be monitoring, uh, monitoring that, so feel free. Um, so that, like I was saying, there are really two big questions in the economics of climate change. Uh, how much to reduce and how to accomplish that. So kind of, kind of logical. How much to reduce really just means how much CO2 does society, not, not us as individuals, but society want in the atmosphere and taking, taking into account the fact that society is a very, very heterogeneous concept. And when we look at Trump versus Biden, we know in the US there are all sorts of opinions on different issues. Well, think of the whole world. Uh, ranging from very, very poor individuals in poor countries to the to wealthy individuals in wealthy countries. But we're not talking about individuals, we're talking about society as a whole. So it's a very tough question to answer. And the answer is clearly not zero, since uh, carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases provide a lot of value to us. We had to cut them off entirely we couldn't drive our car anywhere. We really couldn't turn on our electric lights. A uh, whole, whole long list of things. So there's some, some balance in how much to reduce. And, and then the second question is, supposing we've answered that question, which, which the world has not answered yet, uh, then how do you accomplish that reduction? In other words, how do you get people to reduce? Do you just ask them politely? or do you have some sort of law or incentive? How do you, how do, you do it? Uh, not just people, but organizations. Uh, businesses, of course, respond to the profit motive, but what about governments um, who don't really respond to, it's not clear what they respond to. They respond to public pressure sometimes, but not always. So, so how do you accomplish that reduction? And how do we deal with uncertainty? So th those are the big questions and issues. Like in any research area, within each one of these, there are big problems that are components of the overall problem where a lot of people's research career focuses, for instance, on what is the damage from the change in climate. Anyway, we'll, we'll, we'll go through on some highlights of this. So this is from the IPCC, a big UN organization that's designed to synthesize data on climate change. What, what this shows is, is their best estimate of where we are going uh, for the remainder of this century in the uh, 
climate change arena. So this is uh, across the horizontal axis, of course, is the uh, um, is time through 2100. The vertical axis is annual emissions. And we're basically uh, have three different, we call them scenarios, possibilities for the future. One that leads us to about four or five degrees C in, uh, um, in the year 2100. And that's more or less the path we're on now, business as usual, as it's called. And uh, the bottom one, the blue one, is what it takes to get to about two degrees C. And as some of you may be aware, there was a big debate in, uh, in Paris a few years ago about whether we should be going to one and a half degrees C as the increase in temperature over uh, pre-industrial levels. And it ended up being two degrees, but a lot of people think two degrees at, from our point of view of 2020 is unattainable. Uh, and one reason you can see is if you look at this graph, note that to achieve two degrees C, we have to have a negative emissions in the latter part of the century, negative emissions. That means we take out more CO2 than we put into it, which is so far, so far from where we are today um, that it's, that it's um, difficult to imagine that occurring, uh, but it could occur, it could occur. So let's first talk about the costs of uh, viewing this as a lens where there are costs of action and there are costs of inaction. Um, cost of action, these, these, these figures sort of show the, the nature of that, going to smaller cars, going to, this is a little bit obsolete, but you could tell that this is a compact fluorescent light bulb. If I put up an LED bulb, it would look pretty similar to an incandescent bulb, uh, using less energy. Um, there's also uh, another thing you can do is uh, uh, insulate your house better. These are, these are all things we know reduce energy, and energy is the flip side of climate change. We produce carbon dioxide when we combust energy. And then down in the bottom corner, bottom left corner here, we have a diagram of the sequestration process, whereby uh, we take the CO2 out of the smokestack, or out of the air, and pump it underground and hope, cross our fingers, that it stays there for a million years, which is a big figure crossing exercise. It's unlikely that human species will be around in a million years. So that's the cost of action. All those things take, take uh, energy, effort, uh, human effort, and uh, dollars, and all of them reduce the emissions we generate. Cost of inaction is what happens if we don't act. We also incur costs. And I, there's a picture of a flooded city up here uh, from a flood and the, uh, just a diagram of, of one way of, of avoiding damage from the flood, but it involves costs as well, building a house that's above the uh, flood level. Uh, another cost is essentially drought, uh, denuding uh, large areas of productive land. That's a cost of inaction. And then here we have uh, uh, a polar bear who's probably quite happy, but the idea here is that the ice may disappear, which the polar bear won't like. And I always get a kick out of this adaptation diagram here. The polar bear is painting his um, companion to be more like a panda, so he doesn't have to deal with the ice as much. So we have cost of action, cost of, and he, here we have uh, other, another slide, a second slide, I'm only gonna show two of them from the IPCC, which essentially shows uh, four scenarios. The one on the far right is the two degree one, 450 parts per million. 
and the costs associated with doing it in uh, 2030, 2050, and 2100, and showing the cost in terms of a percent of world output. So think, think for this median here, about 5%, it's basically about 5% of your personal income. You can think of it as that, although it's national income. Now that's, that's not a lot, but it's, uh, it's a significant amount of money, particularly for the for people that have a difficult time eating. So we've got costs being estimated uh, on both sides of this equation. So this is just a, uh, um, this is a, a list of some more things that can be done to uh, expenditures that can reduce emissions. And uh, the purpose of some of these items is to show that costs are not the kind of cost we normally think of. When we you know, go to the grocery store, we buy a, can a loaf of bread, we think of the cost as being the amount of money that it takes to exchange for that loaf of bread. But here we have uh, a, a lot broader sense of costs. Uh, investments in fuel efficiency are the kinds of things we've all already talked about. But suppose we talk about foregoing consumption. Suppose uh, prices of products go up and some people can't afford to just continue to buy what they did before. So they give up on uh, buying certain things, switch to, uh, lower costs of protein, for instance. Reduce reductions in the quality of consumption right here. This, this, this means that if you have a family of four and you're forced to ride around in one of these guys, smart cars, you're not as, uh, it's not as comfortable. The, the quality is not as great as if you're in a regular size car or the lighting is inferior. Um, there, are, there are a number of other costs that are all costs associated with climate change, trying to fix the problem. The cost of inaction, this is the damage from letting the carbon run amok, letting the greenhouse gases continue to rise, is the other side of that coin. And a lot of the world, including the US, uh, from the Obama administration, but it continues today, is to synthesize everything in the social cost of carbon. And this is basically defined as uh, what the costs are if we were to inject one metric ton of carbon dioxide emissions into the atmosphere today, and then look at the marginal changes in all the negative and positive consequences that occur over the hundred or so years, that ton remains in the, in the atmosphere. And what you get is uh, something that looks like this. You get a, uh, an increase as the, the ton is injected, you start getting an increase in damages, temperature goes up a little bit, not much, but that's, it's only one ton. And you get, it, you get a lot of impacts early on and then they taper off. Now, the reason, one reason they taper off is that we're discounting the far distant future. And the discount rate you can see is a very important factor. With a higher discount rate, 5% per year, the damages dissipate fairly quickly. That doesn't mean they go anywhere. That just means we don't care as much about what happens in the year 2200. The discount rate is, is sort of the opposite of the interest rates you get at the bank. If the bank is paying you 5%, you're going to get, your money's going to grow a lot more quickly than if they pay you 2.5% or even 1%. But the flip side of that is that at a lower discount rate, the future becomes more important and it magnifies the uh, damage caused by that extra ton of carbon dioxide. So, so how, how is the social cost of carbon actually used? Why is it important? Well, in the US and many other countries, for every major regulation, there are many small ones. 
and efficiency standards for vending machine prompted this because before the, before the social cost of carbon, carbon was omitted from the cost benefit analysis of regulations. Nowadays, uh, most recently the clean power plan, the social cost of carbon is an important factor in weighing what regulation should be taking. And in fact, those of you that follow the news know that the Obama administration put through the clean power plan about five years ago, and the Trump administration has proposed uh, essentially tossing it or greatly weakening it. And it all, all of the debate hinges on what the value is of the social cost of carbon. So calculating the social cost of carbon, this is where people have used uh, models, uh, computer models of the economy and the atmosphere and the environment. And there are three main ones that the US government uses. And you, the models essentially allow you to inject an additional ton of carbon into the atmosphere and trace out the extra damages over the next few centuries. Um, these, are, these three models are fundamentally different approaches, but it gives you an answer. Currently in the US, well, the, the social cost of carbon prior to Trump was about $40 a ton. So the, the US considered that each ton of carbon emitted is causing over the lifetime of that carbon in the atmosphere about $40 of damage. Trump administration cut it to about $3. And hence, you get a different answer when you do a cost benefit analysis of something like the clean power plant. There's also a lot of uncertainty. This is a PDF, not, not a portable document format, but a uh, probability density function for, or actually most, more like a frequency plot, same thing, of uh, the social cost of carbon. This is the range in which the uh, US government considers it, but you can see it goes way out. There's probability, in fact, that the social cost of carbon is quite high, very high, and also a probability that it's quite low. Okay, so, um, before we turn to a breakout session, I want to just address the second big question in economics is how to get people and organizations to reduce their emissions. It's not easy uh, getting the uh, US population, let alone the world population, to do anything. Uh, it's, it's very difficult to get people to do things voluntarily, though they do. It's uh, also difficult to get to agree on what kind of uh, regulations or government mandates are needed. And uh, there are really two approaches that, that we look at in, in considering how to get people to reduce emissions. One is incentives, where we don't tell them to do anything. We just provide in, uh, rewards for reducing emissions, penalties for increasing emissions. Take, for example, California and the electric car. We view electric cars as uh, desirable for reducing CO2 emissions. So we give a uh, tax incentive, substantial one, for people to buy electric cars. Um, and of course, there are many other examples of rewards or penalties associated with increasing emissions. The second way to do it is what we call command and control. And that's essentially where we tell polluters what they can and cannot do. Automobile fuel efficiency mandates are an example of that, where we say, if you're going to sell a car in the United States, this is what its fuel efficiency has to be. No, no, no debate. Uh, renewable portfolio standards are another one where we basically require electric utilities to use a certain fraction of their generation uh, based on renewables. Okay, so that's a quick pass through these issues. Um, what, what I'd like to do now is have some breakout sessions. Um, I'm, I'm told this will work flawlessly and smoothly, that we'll all go into uh, sessions of uh, four people or so. And within those sessions, um, 
essentially you can decide on one person to report back to the group at 915. But uh, the questions I'd like you to ask in your group is I, to first of all, these four bullets, identify the nature of the emissions you as individuals are responsible for. So directly is, is pretty easy. You know, you drive you have a car, you drive it around, it uses gasoline that generates emissions. When you push the switch on the wall to get electricity, back somewhere in the, uh, who knows where, uh, pollution is probably being generated. Okay, that's that you can talk about. Then there's also indirectly. Uh, that's when you buy products that involve emissions in productions. So if, for instance, if you, if you buy a uh, uh, you know, phone, it, you, the, the phone was made in uh, probably in China and uh, there, was, there were emissions associated with its manufacture. Uh, if it's an Apple phone, there are emissions associated with the engineers in Cupertino. Uh, all of those things are attributable to the, per to the person that buys it. Um, a, a big sensitive point for students at, who are paying Stanford to enroll at Stanford is that you actually are responsible for all of the emissions of Stanford University because you are the customer and the product is your education. So uh, if you think of indirectly, a lot of the emissions that we are individually responsible, responsible for come through this indirect mechanism. So discuss these things, be as specific as possible. Then I want you to identify some incentives or rules or regulations that would encourage you to change your behavior, be realistic. Think of yourself and whether how you would respond to that. And what changes need to be mandated by the government to help you reduce your emissions in chat? Uh, yeah, so John has a question about what are your thoughts on carbon tax? What's the most promising path in your view of how countries or even a collision can come together to agree on something like this? Well, I, I, I personally think, and this is an opinion, uh, that getting all of the countries of the world to agree to something is uh, um, like having a love fest between Trump and Biden. It's totally impossible to, or it's, it's very difficult to do. Um, in recent times, country, big countries have been going in on their own, which I think is much more effective. There are only a half dozen countries that are responsible for most emissions, the US, China, India, Brazil, um, the European Union. And if they unilaterally take action, uh, they don't need to have an agreement, but it can be just as effective. And maybe after that's working, uh, the next step would be to try to reach agreement. The problem with reaching agreement is that if you fail to reach agreement, the status quo persists. And we've seen over the last 30 years, every year the nations of the world get together to try to reach an agreement and they fail to do it. So basically the status quo is what you end up with. Um, and there are a few more follow-up follow questions on that. Um, should we uh, answer them right now or we Which should- Which time are we, are we supposed to end? Um, 9.25. 9.25, we can, let's take another one. Okay. Um, so Charles Stone uh, had an additional question to John's. What do you think is the right social cost of carbon figure? Um, and how should we think about the right discount rate at, in this context? Well, I, th I think the, um, uh, the figure is highly uncertain, but I think the Obama administration did a very uh, a rigorous job in determining what it was. Now that is about five years old. So it's probably when it's updated and we'll have to wait for either 2021 or 2025 for that. Um, when it's updated, it may go up a bit. But I think the important thing to remember is that it's a probability distribution and there's chances that it's quite high, chances that it's quite low. 
And I think that uncertainty actually has a lot to say about how you how you approach regulating carbon. So, so I think uh, everyone is back. So that, that's very efficient. Thank you, everybody. I'm, I'm sorry that uh, uh, everything went so quickly. It's this, um, all of us are getting used to this Zoom for, for class uh, classwork, but I hope it was enough time to get some, uh, uh, to, to make some progress. So <clears throat> what I'm gonna do is, uh, Jenny is going to just pick um, randomly one of the breakout groups and we'll just go through them and uh, um, spend, I'd like to ask you to spend uh, no more than 30 seconds or so talking about uh, your findings on the, on the two questions that were raised. But before we get there, there were two, two questions in the chat, which I had a chance to look at over the, um, while you were in breakout sessions. And let me just address those. One interesting question is how do you choose between uh, price incentives versus direct regulations? And uh, that's a terrific question. And uh, it's, it turns out to be, um, it's the, the answer is not one is always better than the other. Even though economists like incentives, although we much prefer to, to let people do what they want, just have the incentive structure that, so that they, they do what we would like them to do. The fact is that sometimes that's, it's very complicated. It's very difficult to uh, manage an electric power grid, for instance, uh, second to second using pure prices. Um, it's, it's very difficult to get uh, automobile manufacturers to design cars in a certain way. So in, in mostly a price incentive or a subsidy works well. Often you have to look at two factors. One is the uh, economic dimensions of it, but the second is the political dimensions. Some, some rules and incentives are easier to get through the legislature than others. And ultimately everything we do and democracies anyway has to go through the legislature. So it's a, it's, it's a much more complicated question than you think. Second question regards what is the appropriate social discount rate? That's a great question. Um, if you look at the section of the chapter that I uh, wrote in the uh, IPCC, the latest uh, IPCC, uh, the consensus is that a social discount rate down around uh, two, percent is about right, but there's uncertainty about it. Um, one to three percent, something like that is about right. But it's, it's highly controversial. It's not just uh, observationally derivable. It also involves ethical dimensions, which makes it tough. So let's, uh, let's move on to uh, try to get through as many breakout sessions as we can in the six minutes we've got left or whatever it is. Uh, Jenny, you want to pick somebody? Sure, I'm just using this <laughs> random number generator on Google and then uh, we are going to go with team five. Um, so we discussed a variety of ways in which uh, we contribute emissions, including transportation, electricity usage, and um, uh, meat consumption. We, spoke, we focused then specifically on the issue of transportation and discussed both the regulatory and incentive sides of things. On the regulatory front, we discussed a gas tax as well as a tax on individual car ownership to occur at uh, the point of purchase. Generally, we focused more on um, point source solutions rather than longitudinal solutions due to the difficulty of uh, tracking mileage. Um, on the incentive side of things, we discussed uh, how to encourage alternate forms of transit. That would be th through things like congestion pricing for vehicles, as well as, um, you know, municipalities subsidizing membership in bike share or other types of uh, mass transit usage, um, in addition to providing uh, good infrastructure for those alternative forms of transit. That's terrific. Let me, let me just comment that uh... Those, those will all work. <clears throat> Taxes on gas tend to be the third rail of American politics. 
in much the same way as speed limits on autobahns of the third rail in Germany. Uh, and one has to take that into account in structuring a, uh, a, way, a path forward. Everybody loves a subsidy. Yeah, but the only problem there is you have to pay for it with, with something. But those, those are great ideas. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks. Um, I wrote another dice, and then uh, we have breakout room three. That's Charles, Daniela, and Louis. Yeah, so um, Danielle, Louis, and I chatted mainly about uh, meat consumption and the meat industry. Um, and we discussed the, the concept that um, it's probably hard to institute any outright bans on, on forms of meat consumption, um, but that leveraging uh, essentially behavioral change through marketing, like with the USDA doing um, kind of food pyramid type recommendations, uh, and also uh, potentially subsidizing the development of meat alternatives um, could be viable paths to have a kind of lower meat diets. Um, yeah, that's, that's sort of where we got to. How, how's that worked for sugar? Uh, I'm not exactly sure what, what, what actually, what actually yeah. happened. There. Yeah, I mean, we, we all know the sugar's not good for us, but the amount of right. sugar consumed in the United States and Europe is enormous. Right, right, right. Uh, but it, but it, 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 you have limited instruments is, is, is a good point. I mean, one other way of doing it is to generate substitutes, which is seems to be taking off uh, like Impossible Foods based here in Redwood City and Beyond Beef, where you don't try to change behavior, you, you try to make it easy to be a good citizen. But that, you know, that's a toughie. A lot of people say, make the world a vegetarian. Uh, that's, that's hard to do. And um, so thinking, thinking of ways to do it, that, levers that you have uh, is, is a, obviously the right way to think through the problem. It's a tough problem, very tough problem. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, Charles, we only have one minute. Would you like to close? Um, sure, Did anybody have any, let, let me just, would anybody like to raise their hand if they have a really pressing thing they'd like to contribute to the, to the group? Okay, well, I'll, I'll raise my hand. So uh, this is, this is I, I wish we had more time because the, the, I think you're through, through the chat and through the, uh, through the comments we've had here, obviously many of you have thought a lot about this and deeply, it's not a superficial group. So it would be terrific to have uh, uh, more discussion. But let me just say, since you're all, I think you're all PhD students or graduate students anyway, um, really structure your research program and your educational program here at Stanford so that you're actually able to contribute to solutions to this. You're gonna to have to pick a little tiny corner of the problem and devote your research skills to it. Pick something that's important and something that interests you and you can make a terrific contribution to the future of the world. That's probably the most effective way any of us here today can, can operate. Thank you very much.